Induction is a fundamentally new way of thinking about ideas and how they are proven. In an inductive proof, it's not enough to just show that some mathematical idea follows from a definition. We have shown in our last eight videos that these ideas are actually derived from observation. However, in this video, I want to specifically draw your attention to the fact that validating an idea from observation actually isn't enough. One must also show the reason the idea is important, the human goals that make the idea worth thinking about. There are many facts out there and a near infinite number of ways to combine them. As a result, only ideas that serve some particular human purpose are justified. This is why each of our videos begins with a motivation phase. Before giving the observations and reasoning steps for a given idea, we explain why one should explore the subject to begin with. If I were to start today's video with a definition, say, zero is the number for when no units are present, then that would be validated by observation. But an inductive mindset would still ask a question. It would ask, why are we keeping track of units that aren't there? Why do we need a concept of zero? In order to inductively prove negative numbers and the concept of zero, we're gonna have to first start with an explanation of the kind of situation that motivates these ideas. Since the goals we are trying to achieve in a given situation actually constitute part of the evidence that justifies the nature of that idea. This is in sharp contrast to the way math is usually explained, where a system of abstract definitions and rules are presented at first, and then their applications are presented afterwards, almost as a kind of happy coincidence. To truly understand mathematics, we start with practical applications, then reason to abstractions, not the other way around. So let's understand that aspect of the process of induction here on Inductica. Motivation one. Let's move to a new character in our story this time, Ark, who is a traitor from Seshatet. Now Ark, is a friend of Rom's. He's often visiting with Rom to exchange goods, and right now is one of those occasions. Ark and Rom have exchanged a number of goods, and as a final aspect of the trade, Rom asks Ark for three cats. Remember that the sessions raise a lot of cats as pets, and so Rom asks Ark for three cats in exchange for four, ten, and five skins of wine from Babel. And Ark is uh, sad to report that He's actually out of cats, he's already traded them all away. But Rom has an idea. Rom says, I'll give you your wine for now, but in exchange for a promise that you'll give me those three cats later, once you get them on hand. Now notice that having trust between traders actually leads to a great mutual benefit. Ark gets his wine now, and Rom gets a right to some cats as soon as Ark has them back in stock. So Ark thinks this is a great idea, and so he starts proposing many more trades like this, many more borrowing and lending agreements. And as a result of this, he's found that he needs to change his account book. He already had an account book that looked like this. So you can see on the left, we have different goods that Ark is keeping track of. And on the right, he has a list of how many of each good. But now he wants to keep track of debts that he owes to others and is owed. So that leads Ark to the following question. Question one, what policy can we use to manage an account book to keep track of stocks, what we are owed by other people, and what we owe other people. Investigation one. So Ark comes up with this new table to keep track of what he owes and what he is owed by other people. So notice that in the first column, it's the name of all of these different goods. Then in the second column, he's written out his stocks. These are the actual items that he has on hand in his physical possession. Now in further columns, what we see is it explains what he owes other people or is owed. So here's some examples. So he has written down that he owes Rom three of those session cats. What else does he owe Rom? He owes Rom some session beer. He's loaned some of that out. Alternatively, Rom owes Ark 10 wolf skins. You can see he's kept track of this for a number of different traders. We have Hef, Maz, Grawl. These are 
some of ARK's trading partners, and he's kept track of assets and debts with them over the course of time. Now, what ARK realizes is, is that he has to figure out how many of each good he has a right to. Now, what do I mean by that? He realizes he needs to tally up all of his assets and debts to figure out, do I owe more than I'm entitled to, or am I entitled to a lot more from other people? If a lot of other people owe him a lot of a given good, then that means he can loan a lot of that good out and he can use that as an advantage in his trades. On the other hand, if he owes a lot of that good out to other people, he should probably stop taking loans of that good from other people so he doesn't get too far behind on that particular good. So he comes up with the word assets and debts. Assets are certain things he has a right to. So this includes things that are in his stocks, but it also includes the quantities of goods that other people owe him. Then he has a concept of a debt, and these are amounts of a certain good that he owes other people. So in order to find his assets and debts of each kind, he comes up with this column on the far right to come up with the total asset or debt. Now, to find the total asset or debt, Rom knows that he has to subtract debts from assets since he can see that subtraction is applicable in this particular case. And that, of course, uses a prior induction, which is linked in the description. So let's first find out the asset or debt of wine. So first, he has 410, 5, and 1 red wine skins in his actual reserve. He also has written down that he owes Maz five. After doing cancellation, he finds that he has a total asset of this many wines. This allows Ark to come to an intermediate conclusion. When combining a larger asset and a smaller debt, one simply subtracts the debt from the asset. Since the way debt cancels an asset is the same as subtraction, so long as the asset is of greater quantity. So next, Ark has to figure out his total stock of cats. So he owes Rom three, but Grull owes him five and one. So he can write five and one minus three, and that of course comes out to three. So what Ark has done here is he's changed the order of combining the assets and the debt. When we combine assets and debts, order doesn't matter. So Ark has come to an intermediate conclusion that one can combine assets and debts in any order and still get the same result. So in this case, an asset of five and one and a debt of three, thinking of it in that order is easier so that you can subtract and get the total. Next, Ark is going to figure out the total amount of beer he has a right to. Now, what he's found is that he has loaned out a lot of beer because he knows a lot of brewers. So he has a lot of beer debt. So Ark is going to have to add up all of those debts in order to figure out the total amount of debt. And of course, this uses a previous induction, which is Roman numeral addition. So all that is is 10 plus 5 plus 5 plus 2. And this comes out to 210 and two beer kegs that he owes other people. This, of course, teaches him an intermediate conclusion, which is that when debts are combined, they add to make a greater debt. So it's worth noting that debts are units like any other. When you have a bunch of debts, you simply add them. So he's learning all of these different rules of assets and debts piece by piece. Next, Ark is thinking about his wolf skins or his total wolf skin asset or debt he has a right to, and he sees that he has a lot of assets and debts. So first what he's gonna do is he's just gonna add up all of the assets. So he has two 10 and one and 10. So he adds all of that together and that comes out to three 10 and one. So that's his total assets. Then he adds up all of his debts. And so he owes one person two 10, five and one. He owes another person 10 and four. He adds these debts together and gets 410. So what he sees here is that his total debts are greater than his total assets. So he knows that this is gonna come out to a debt at the end of the day, but how can he do this? Just as debt cancels an asset, Ark actually realizes that assets cancel debts. He can think of debts as being kind of the primary and just thinks of subtracting the assets from the debts. So as a result, he does 
410 minus 310 and one. He's subtracting the assets from the debts and he sees that he has a total debt of five and four. And so he writes that he owes out five and four wolf skins. This allows Ark to come to an intermediate conclusion. When one combines a lesser asset and a greater debt, one finds the total debt by subtracting the asset from the debt. That's one more rule for combining assets and debts. Lastly, he's going to find his total asset or debt of Pasharan arrows. So like last time, he is going to add up all of his assets. Okay, and so that's 210 and two plus three. So that's 210 and five total assets of arrows. Next, he's gonna use subtraction to account for the debt he owes Grull. And this is 210 and five minus 210 and five. And so the assets are equal to the debts in this case. And so that's sort of similar to having none of it. So that's what he writes on the far right of his chart. It's as though he has no arrows at all. And this allows him to come to an intermediate conclusion, which is that when one's total assets and debts are equal, it's like having a right to none of that good. So conclusion one. Ark has learned quite a few things about combining assets and debts. Let's just collect them all here. He came to four separate conclusions. Number one, when combining a larger asset and a smaller debt, one subtracts the debt from the asset, since the way a debt cancels an asset is the same as subtraction. And this works so long as the asset is of greater quantity. Number two, one can combine assets and debts in any order and still get the same result. Number three, when one combines a lesser asset and a greater debt, one finds the total debt by subtracting the asset from the debt. And number four, when one's total assets and debts are equal, it is like having a right to none of that good. So over the course of time, Ark uses this table and all of these rules I've told you about for a while. But after a while, he realized to, to sort of make things quicker to write down, instead of saying I owe, he just writes this little minus sign because it's like taking away. So he puts that negative sign there to simply represent the fact that he owes, in this case, 210 and five. He gets rid of, the whole idea of I-O. In addition, instead of saying none, he makes that quicker. He writes this symbol. It's kind of like a circle with nothing in it. So that represents none. Motivation two. One day, Ark acquired 210 dried fish from a local trader, and he knew that he already had a debt of 10 and two. He knows that he has got to figure out what his total asset is now that he has gained a few more fish. Now, normally he would rearrange this and then subtract the debt from the assets. But when he looks at this problem, he realizes, well, wait, debt cancels assets. So I don't have to rearrange. I can just start canceling right away. And so he starts canceling from both. And then of course he expands and finds that at the end of the day, his total asset is five and three dried fish. In another situation, he finds that he has to add a lesser asset to a greater debt. He has an asset of five and two of something, and then he adds a debt of 10. Once again, he would normally reverse this and then think of debts as primary, and he would subtract five and two from 10. But then he realizes, again, assets just cancel debts, so I can just start canceling right away. And he expands the debt out so that he can cancel all of these assets, and he finds that at the end, he has a debt of three. What's interesting is, is when you add assets and debts, you can cancel them regardless of the order of the assets and debts. You don't need to rearrange them or think about your debt as being the primary unit you're keeping track of. Another piece of vocabulary he came to, instead of calling them debts, he started calling them negative numbers. Since their primary characteristic is that they negate normal numbers, they cancel with them. So he starts calling these negative numbers. And as a result of calling them negative numbers, he starts calling normal numbers positive numbers. Why positive? Because they posit the existence of something. He now has the concept of positive and negative numbers. Now, a final concept that we're going to induce today comes from when Ark tries to explain a certain asset and debt to someone. He's trying to explain to one of his business partners what happens when you have, say, a debt of three, so you have negative three of something, and then you add an asset of four. His friend's having trouble understanding the cancellation and stuff. So Ark actually thinks of a whole nother way 
of thinking about positive and negative numbers. He thinks about this line, a line of numbers where we have negative numbers on the left and positive numbers on the right, counting upward as we go to the right, but then also counting more and more negative as we go to the left. In order to explain negative three plus four, he says, start at negative three, then move four units to the right. Assets move you to the right, okay? Then he explains to his friend, let's say I borrow one more of that unit. Borrowing one means a negative number and debts move you to the left on this chart. So if we move one unit to the left, now you have none. Arc has invented this rule where gaining something moves you to the right on this line and losing or going into debt into something moves you to the left on this line. And so the line helps you understand the relationships between positive and negative numbers. Now, in this particular example, Arc realizes that none of something in the middle is actually a quantity. It's actually a quantity between positive and negative numbers. This symbol, he starts calling it zero and you can see that arc has proven the concept of zero. Conclusion two. And of course, this is going to be kind of a set of conclusions. Number one, to keep track of debts, we can use negative numbers. Numbers which, when added to positive numbers, cancel with them. When adding any combination of positive or negative numbers, the order of addition does not matter. Number three, a quantity which can be either positive or negative can be tracked with the number line as positive and negative numbers are added to that total. The addition of positive numbers moves the total to the right on this line. The addition of negative numbers moves the total to the left on this line. And finally, number four, none of something is indicated with the number zero. It's possible to have none of something now that we understand it, none in this broader context. Closing remarks. That is an inductive proof of negative numbers and of the concept of zero. Notice how carefully I set the motivation up. Notice that if Ark was just keeping track of like one or two debts that he owed to a couple of people, he wouldn't need negative numbers. He wouldn't need this whole system of keeping track of things. It only is in the case of sort of complex accounting that it becomes necessary to even come up with a whole system of negative numbers in order to account for that. And of course, a system of zero. So to motivate negative numbers, I told this whole story where Arc had to come up with a system of lending and borrowing. So this teaches us a certain aspect of inductive logic. Because the purpose that leads to an idea actually shapes the nature of that idea, we have to explain that purpose as part of the evidence and justification for that form of the idea. As a result, we can see that motivation is part of inductive proof. So if you'd like to join me on the next chapter of this epic inductive journey, hit subscribe or watch the next video to find out how our next hero, Algamesh, invents a new system of numbers, which is even more powerful than Rom's system. This video is part of a longer series dedicated to reproving the essential ideas of math and physics by showing an actual process of observation and reasoning steps scientists could have taken to prove these conclusions. Observational proofs, also known as inductive proofs, give us a deeper, reality-based understanding of these abstract ideas and demonstrate the proper method of scientific proof. This series starts with cavemen counting rocks and will continue all the way to the frontiers of quantum and relativistic phenomena. This epic story will proceed in a possible order of discovery, since science always progresses by reasoning about observations using what has been discovered earlier. To discover the long-term goal and the true power of this project, visit my channel page for more information. To see the playlist for this series or to see my channel, just click on the links on the screen. Finally, if you'd like more lectures like this, just go to patreon.com slash inductica. For just $5 a month, you gain access to the written rigorous forms of these proofs, as well as my 34-hour lecture series, An Inductive Summary of Physics. I'll see you in the next video as this inductive journey continues.